Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Thank you to all who have joined us across various time zones today and a very warm welcome to our third high profile keynote address 2022. My name is Meera Mawani and I am an executive board member for Association for the Study of Ginans and also lead Ginan Insights webinar series, which was developed to examine different aspects of Ginan in order to have a better understanding of this remarkable literature. We conduct these webinars a few times a year and through them we hope to develop a conversation about past and current areas of research into Ginans so that this extraordinary poetic heritage generates greater awareness and space for sharing knowledge and inspire people to study and research this wonderful tradition of Ginans. In addition, every year in December, we organize a high profile keynote address, which is graced by a distinguished scholar who brings unique perspective on Ginans. This year, we have invited yet another distinguished scholar, Professor Karim H. Karim. Before I introduce our keynote speaker, I would like to invite the chairman of ASG, Mr. Shiraz Pradhan, to say a few words. A little about our chairman. Mr. Pradhan has been the chairman of ASG since 2019. He's an engineering consultant, author, philosopher, novelist, and has been engaged in Gidan studies for 30 years and wrote extensively for Elm UK and Simurg.com. He's proficient in several South Asian languages and published many essays and articles on Ginans. He's also the head of research at ASG. We're also looking forward to his new book, Amrapuri, which traces the footsteps of Nizari Satvant since the time of Pir Satgur Noor. Chairman Shiraz, over to you. Thanks very much, Meera. Our Ginan Association's high-profile annual keynote address, as Meera stated, has become a well-established tradition. We try to bring leading scholars to present the latest studies on Ginans and Satvan tradition. And of course, Professor Karim H. Karim, Karim will be our third keynote address. The first was presented by Professor Ali Asani from Harvard in 2020, followed by Dr. Aziz Ismail, who was at that time the director of Institute of Ismaili Studies in 2021. And we hope to keep this address alive every year. One area that has been neglected over the past several decades are our grants. There are over 83 grants. These are longer narratives of prose and poetry. Apart from a few well-known grants, such as Brahm Prakash, Bush Niranjan, or Saloko Moto and Nano, the rest of them are relatively unknown. We aim to bring this to light in year 2023, 24, and beyond through our lectures and through our publications. I won't take too long. Please continue to support us in our journey to preserve and promote our Ginan traditions. We very much appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. And now the moment we've been waiting for, I'm delighted to introduce Professor Karim H. Karim. He is Chancellor's Professor at Carlton University and has held directorships at the Carlton Center for Study of Islam and the Institute of Ismaili Studies. Dr. Karim is a critically acclaimed award-winning author whose research covers several areas, including the Satvant tradition, contemporary Ismaili developments, the clash of ignorance, intercultural relations, diaspora, the social dimensions of technology and the social dimensions of technology usage. He has been a visiting scholar at Harvard, Simon Fraser and Aga Khan universities and has helped to establish academic programs in Kenya and Central Asia. Professor Karim has delivered distinguished lectures in several countries and has been asked to provide his insights by media organizations around the world. Canada's government has honored him for fostering collaboration between religious communities. Dr. Karim has organized several international conferences, including the second Ismaili Studies Conference. He and his wife recently established a prize to recognize research excellence in understudied aspects of Ismaili studies. Professor Karim, it is an honor to have you with us today, and I'd, li I'd like to hand it over to you now. Thank you very much, Mira. Really appreciate this. I'll just put up my uh, presentation. So good morning, good afternoon, uh, and good evening to people who 
watching in. Uh, thank you very much for tuning in and thank you very much to the Association of the uh, Study of Kinaz for inviting me. Before I begin, I'll do what is traditional in Canada by saying that I'm speaking from the traditional unceded territory of the Squamish, Musqueam and the Slail Watooth nations who for thousands of years have cherished, tended and protected the area that is now known as Vancouver. This lecture is dedicated to the memory of Dominique Sila Khan, who was a scholar of South Asia's shared and overlapping cultures. So what I would like to state at the outset is that my purpose is to demonstrate that the question of whether Guinans are Islamic or Hindu is itself misplaced. It is superficial, it focuses on constructed identities, and it does not necessarily deal with spirituality. This lecture will cover the following, that the Guinans in a universal human context, it is important to understand the interconnections of human spirituality. We also need to recognize the problematic understanding of the term religion. There is a, has been a search for universal truth in various Ismaili traditions, in fact, all Ismaili traditions. We need to know Satpanth and Ginan's placement within the Indic Islamic context and to recognize that Guinans have a certain perceptiveness, dynamism, and eternal relevance. What I would like to really base this lecture on is the idea of human spirituality, which is universal. Religions are in conflict with, conflict with each other from time to time. And unfortunately, the media and the general public tend to focus on that. But human beings share a common spiritual sense, which cannot be denied. Most feel the desire to nourish the inner being, the spirit. We hold goodness, morality, ethics, and truth to be important. And people strive for a connection with each other in a spiritual way. Now, of course, there are atheists and agnostics who may not agree with this, but religious believers certainly seek a deep relation with divinity. When we look at the particular tradition of Satpant, we see that there has been a quest for truth in Satpant, but also in other Ismaili traditions that have focused on the term truth, sat in Indian languages and haq in Arabic and Persian. Many Ginans speak of following satpant, the true path or the path of truth. In Arabic, Ismaili Dai spoke of dawat al haq which can be translated as invitation or summons to truth or the mission of truth. So truth is a very, very important aspect of the faith of Satpant. Now, in my presentation, in my lecture, one of the key ideas is that spiritual truth cannot be expressed in everyday language. And I'm sure all of you recognize this. Symbolic language is used in Quran Sharif and other religious texts in various other script scriptures of other religions, as well as in Ginans. Now the Ismaili movement has been indigenous to the Middle East, Central Asia and South Asia, and of course flourishes in many other parts of the world now. But a key aspect of Ismaili, the Ismaili movement is adherence to the inner meaning, batin, of religious texts. The batin, the, the, the spiritual, the deep spiritual meanings are very, very important. 
and I will talk about them a little later. Yunans contain metaphors, symbols, myths, which speak to universal human spirituality. They speak to sat, hak, and truth. Now, one of the key elements of this discourse in Ginans, as well as in the Quran and other scriptures, is myth. Of course, the word myth these days is often related to lies, which is exactly the opposite. Because many of those stories which are told are seen as unrealistic and perhaps irrelevant. But in fact, within these myths, whether they are Norse myths or Indian myths or Chinese myths, doesn't matter. They speak to human beings in a very profound manner. Myth is a symbolic means to narrate spirituality and deep truths. It is expressed in art, in music, in literature, in ritual. It may not even be considered religious. Nevertheless, it has deep meaning. So let's look at how religion has been studied over the last 200 years. Its academic study in the modern times took place, took shape in the 19th century in Europe. But this was of course a time of colonialism in which Europeans and even European academics were very much engaged with the idea of European white supremacy. It was a time of colonialism and the motivation often of academic studies relating to the rest of the world was how to prove the dominance, the legitimacy of European colonialism. And so even religious studies was shaped by colonialism, racism, and Christian supremacy. We need to understand how even academic studies scholarship have political contexts. And this has been written up in a very uh, interesting way by uh, the scholar Tomoko Masuzawa in his book, The Invention of World Religions. So when we look at the way that European and even North American and Australian scholars named various other religions other than Christianity, you notice something. Judaism, Muhammadanism, of course, Muslims protested against that name and ensured that it was called Islam. But initially, even uh, up to the uh, mid 20th century, and even later on, books were called Muhammadanism when they referred to Islam. And the other religions like Hinduism, Buddhism, even of course, Sufism and Ismailism. Why the isms? One would say that perhaps there was an, uh, a motivation to characterize these religions as ideologies. And it's only Christianity which is not called an ism. Another aspect of the study of religion as it emerged at this time was that dogma and orthodoxy are emphasized not the real lived lives of religious followers, but how do the formal prescriptions, what do they say? That was emphasized rather than the actual practices. These religions were constructed as separate and being monolithic. These labels of Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, etc., cetera, were placed on people as being very rigid, not seeing that in the real lives of people, there was a fair amount of fluidity, which I'll talk about later. The diversity of people, or diversity within religions, the way that people practice, the, the way they believe, the way they interacted with other religions, the universal spirituality across religions, the interconnections between them were often downplayed in the study of religion. Now, the interesting thing is that people in other parts of the world 
began to adopt this way of understanding religion because of the very force and strength of colonial ideas. Most people who are probably listening in were shaped in their education by a form of thinking that is based on Western modes of understanding the world. And so even our own religions, our own ideas are looked at through the lens of European ideas. And so even understanding Islam or Ismailism as it is called, or the Hindu faith or other faiths are often looked at through the lens, through, through European lenses, through Western lenses. Of course, many people have an affinity with universal, universal spirituality, as I've said before, but religious identities of large numbers of people, we have to recognize that. For example, even though the terms Sunni and Shia are seen as very binary, that these are completely separate peoples, they believe in different things, they understand religion and spirituality in a very different way, even though they are Muslims. But we, when we look at, at many Sunnis, we see that they have an affection for the Prophet's family, for the Ahl al-Bayt. So how do you explain that? This is supposed to be only a Shia characteristic. Religion is much more complex than some people have us believe. Of course, there are many overlapping religious practices in India among Sikhs, Hindus, Muslims, and others. And in many other parts of it as well, we see these kinds of interconnections. Of course, when the British were in India, they were carrying out censuses in which there would be very specific categories. And one could only tick off one category and be identified as that just Hindu or just Muslim or just Sikh, even though a Hindu would visit a shrine dedicated to a Sufi, a Muslim. And similarly, Muslims would attend Hindu religious ceremonies. That was not recognized. They were just pegged into these boxes, which in which people began to then rethink their identification. The fluidity often was put aside, not completely, but often. And group separation began to harden as a mode of self-identification. People began to stay away from each other. Now, when we look at the Quran, the Quran Sharif, and we look at the word Islam or Al-Islam, it is mentioned only 10 times in the Holy Quran. Of course, this is the religion that was identified in terms of what was preached by the Quran and by Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him. Nevertheless, when we look at the word deen, it is mentioned 98 times. It is a Semitic word, which is also used by other Semitic peoples like Jews, and Sabians, uh, it's in the Aramaic language. It is understood very broadly as the spiritual way, not specific religions, but religion in general, spirituality in general. And when the prophet preached, to him, a broad approach is very clear. It is, it, it is what he favored. He reached out to Jews and Christians and Sabians and various other peoples. This is how he thought of his religion, of Islam. Unfortunately, over many centuries, Muslim thinkers, theologians have tended to narrow down the broadness of Islam and of deen, which has unfortunately had, had, has had strong consequences in the way we think about Islam. When we look at the word Hindu, it actually is a term that was derived by Persian geographers who were studying India, and it was derived from the word Sindhu, which refers to the Indus River. 
in Indian languages in Sanskrit. Now, the term that people in India use to describe their own faith is Sanatana Dharma, which refers to the eternal way. Of course, the word Hindu has become more common, but Sanatana Dharma is the basis of religious belief in India traditionally. So we can see that Deen, the words Deen and Dharma are consonant in universal spirituality, reaching across all human beings. Both Islam and Hinduism, unfortunately, as terms for religions, these two separate religions have become appropriated by identity politics. And this has created a certain division and separateness among people who follow these religions. And I'll talk about that later. Now, Mulana Sultan Muhammad Shah, Aga Khan III, 48th Imam, said in his memoirs, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and all the prophets of Israel are universally accepted by Islam. Muslims indeed know no limitation merely to the prophets of Israel. They are ready to admit that there were similarly divinely inspired messengers in other countries. Gautama Buddha, Sri Krishna, and Sri Ram in India, Socrates in Greece, wise men of China. You can see the kind of broad spiritualism, the universalism that the 48th Imam talked about. There is a strong spiritual interconnection between human beings. And with respect to truth, which is a key part of the spiritual search, many people search for it regardless of its location in a particular region or religion. Truth speaks universally to the individual, in the individual spirit across dogmas. I'm not saying that dogma does not contain truth, but I am emphasizing truth beyond dogma. Often truth is found in the in-between, in the interstices, in the spaces that bridge religious and philosophical systems. So this is in contrast to the very hard identities of religions that have been shaped by, by recent thinking. And of course, I'm not saying that this is only recent thinking, it has existed in different times, but currently it has become very, very strong. Nevertheless, individual believers have long crossed over religious borders and this is not necessarily conversion. We need to rethink the term conversion. What does it mean? If human beings through various religious paths are ultimately devoted to truth, to a universal spirituality, then what does conversion mean? I would like you to pause for a second and think about your own religious identity. And also then consider what is your relationship to universal spirituality, to the search for truth? How do the two relate? And are the two mutually exclusive or not? Now, because of the monolithic nature of seeing religion, people have tended to see their particular religion as being pure, as being unaffected and unrelated to other religions. Nevertheless, as I've said before, Hindus, Jains, Buddhists have intersected for thousands of years. They've borrowed and learned from each other. Christians adopted Jewish and quote unquote pagan elements and incorporated them into Christian belief and ritual. The Holy Quran values goodness in Jewish, Christian, and the Sabian faiths. These are the three religions it mentions. 
because that was the religious context in Arabia. But once Muslims left Arabia, went out to other countries, they also engaged Zoroastrians, Buddhists, and Hindus. And even though there were some conflicts, there was a general openness of understanding, of trying to understand the truth that other people held. Now, we know that Muslims ruled in Spain for 700 years. And when Muslims left, it's interesting that Christians continued to retain Islamic phrases like Bismillah Rahmani Rahim on various aspects of their daily lives, like contracts. Contracts would start off with Bismillah Rahmani Rahim, often in the Spanish language. Tombstones would also have this phrase on them, Bismillah Rahmani Rahim. So it's interesting how people in many periods have thought very broadly about the general spiritual search and have crossed over and borrowed from each other. So when in the early times of, uh, of Islam, uh, when Muslims were engaging after having moved out of Arabia, where uh, generally it was a, uh, a culture which was not given to, uh, to higher learning, there was no tradition of, uh, of the sciences or very little of the sciences or the humanities. There were, of course, uh, aspects like poetry and so on. But Muslims had to learn the intellectual tools from other cultures with whom they were engaging. And as we know, the Middle East is a place where people of different regions have met. This includes intellectuals. And there was knowledge here from Greece, from Rome, from Iran, from India, from China and other lands. And the prophet is supposed to have told Muslims, seek knowledge even as far as China, basically saying, seek knowledge, learn from people around the world and add to your understanding. And so Muslims are very open to learning from others. And you can see how this benefited their art, their architecture, their literature, their music, etc. Even mathematics, science, and medicine, in which Muslims became very proficient. But this was learned. The, basis, the basics were learned from other cultures. And this had an impact on the material civilization of Muslims, which became a re remarkably amazing civilization. And we all know about this. But it was the basis of this was gained from others. And often people forget that. Muslims went on to make tremendous contributions to Europe, to the Renaissance, and, and, and other things, and to the Enlightenment. But they also had learned from others. Muslim philosophy, both Sunni and Shia, falsafa, kalam, theology, and fiqh, law, all of this were, were, had gained from modes of reasoning, of philosophy, categorization, etc., that was learned from other cultures. Other cultures also had an impact on Sufi and Ismaili thought. And we need to understand this. So just as an, as an example of religious architecture, here we have pictures of the dome, first of all, at the top two slides, the top two pictures. Uh, on the left is a Byzantine Christian church, and on the right, of course, the Dome of the Rock, Kubat al-Sakhra in uh, Jerusalem, Al-Quds. And you can see that they have the similarity in the shape of the dome. Now, when the Kubat al-Sakhra, the Dome of the Rock, was built in the early days of Islam, Many Byzantine workers and architects worked on this mosque because this was the area in which where they lived. Similarly, 
the arch, which has become so characteristic of Muslim architecture, was also borrowed from Byzantine Christian religious architecture. On the left, you have the design of uh, the Byzantine um, uh, arches, and on the right, it's the famous mosque of the Umayyads, the Umayyad mosque in Damascus. So you can see how even re in religious architecture, there is this crossover. Of course, we take the tasbi as a as something that is part of how people uh, carry out their devotions, but don't think of its origins. Its origins are in either Christian, in the Christian rosary or the Indic mala. We have to understand that even our devotions are very much interlinked with other religious cultures. Now, you may have heard of the term Neoplatonism. It is a particular uh, philosophy of uh, emanation uh, and relates to uh, understanding um, uh, the, the, the universe and people within it, um, of understanding God uh, and uh, elements of uh, uh, spirituality. This was a, an aspect of the Hellenic culture, of Greek culture. Uh, Plotinus was a philosopher who lived in, in Egypt, I believe in Alexandria, had built on the famous Greek philosopher Plato's ideas uh, and had developed this model of uh, Neo uh, this Neoplatonic model of emanation. It had a huge influence on Muslim philosophers like Al-Farabi, Ibn Sina, and others uh, in the way that they understood uh, divinity and the perfect ruler. So in terms of political science in, uh, in Muslim philosophy. Among Sufis, Ibn Arabi and Al-Sukhrawardi adopted Neoplatonism and the idea of emanation to explain spirituality in their own specific ways. And among Ismailis, we see it in the work of the Ikhwan al safar the Brethren of Purity, and in the work of Abu Yaqob al-Sijistani, as well as many other Ismaili philosophers. They used it to explain Ismaili beliefs of uh, the way to understand God and creation and imamat. So you can see how other cultures, other ideas from other intellectual systems are being used to explain the inexplicable. As I said earlier, it is very difficult to explain spirituality in everyday language. So various thinkers have used models, intellectual models and language and vocabulary from other cultures, other systems to explain their own beliefs. Now, they're speaking about Sijistani again. He was a 10th century Ismaili philosopher. And he was, he found himself in a church and was contemplating the cross. Now, the cross is a very old system. It predates Christianity. And he was, as many Ismaili philosophers and thinkers have been, very broad-minded in approaching other faiths and their symbols. So he was able to see in the cross the concept of one God, of Tawheed. And in the four ends of the cross, he basically saw la illaha illallah, four words, no deity except God. So you can see how Broad minded, how broad minded people were, people like Sajistani, in reaching out across religions to understand one's own religion. Even today, even though there are many conflicts across religions, you see among Christians and Muslims various interactions. On the, on the left, we have the uh, the statue 
of Our Lady of Harissa, commemorating uh, Hazrat Isa, Jesus' mother. And this is in an, the outskirts of uh, Beirut. Uh, it is built and maintained by the Maronite Christians. And you may recall that the Maronites had engaged in a long war against various groups, including Muslims in the 1970s and 80s. Yet, this place, this shrine is visited by many Muslims. And so it may seem inexplicable. It may seem difficult to understand, but people are finding ways to come together, are seeing spirituality across the board. There is uh, a festival, a, a spring festival in Egypt called Shaman Nasim. It is actually a, uh, an ancient uh, a, a, a festival from ancient Egypt, which has become part of an important part of uh, Easter festivities for Christians, for Copts in Egypt, but it's also celebrated by Muslims. So again, another example of crossing over, but keeping your identity as a Muslim. And in, uh, just as another example, in Crete, in Greece, the church of Agnes Nikolaos, you can see the picture here. Uh, this is a typically designed uh, Greek church, which has on the right a bell tower, but there's usually nothing on the left side. Now, when, the Ottomans were ruling in Greece. They had built the minaret on the right side of this church. But the, even after the, Greek, the Turks left, the Ottomans left and their rule ended, the Greeks did not tear down the minaret. In fact, many towns in Crete still contain a whole number of minarets. But it is important to see here that even in a church which is which holds an important Christian relic that the minaret, the Muslim minaret, a sign of the Islamic faith, continues to remain. In India, there has been religious interaction for a long, long time. Unfortunately, people only talk about conflict, but as you can see from these paintings from the past, there are various interactions of people of Hindu and Muslim faiths from uh, on the left, uh, a uh, meeting, a gathering in a village mm -hmm. to the court of uh, Akbar, the emperor, uh, as well as a painting uh, that shows uh, uh, a Mi Mira-like figure uh, who was devoted to Bhakti uh, playing music for, um, for two people who are dressed in uh, Central Asian clothing. Let's talk about Sufism. Uh, of course, another ism, the, the Arabic name for it is the Sawwuf. It is characterized by love for divinity and personal devotion. Now, this particular picture is of Ajmer Sharif, the tomb of Sufi Pir Khwaja Muinuddin Chisti. Uh, it is as described by Mala Chandrasekhar in, a, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in some writing on the cultural heritage of India written earlier this year, she says, it is the most visited Sufi shrine in India for people of all faiths. This is not the only place where this happens. In many locations, uh, Sufi shrines, Hindu shrines, people of various faiths come together. We only, as I said, we only keep hearing about conflict, but this is the other side of the story. So let's talk about Zoroastrian influence. There has been significant Zoroastrian influence on Abrahamic religions. The Zoroastrian religion predates uh, the Abrahamic religions and had, in a way, I had ideas uh, about religion which preceded those in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Ideas like that of the one God, monotheism, good and evil, angels, the final judgment, kiamat, and so on. These are ideas that 
then appeared in the Abrahamic religions. From Iranian mythology, we have poetry, art, philosophy, theology, and Sufi thought, which are influenced by Iranian mythology. The famous Shahnameh is a major work of literature, which has Iranian mythology and was written in Muslim times. The festival of Nowruz, which commemorates the spring equinox, is a festival that is dear to both Shia and Sunni living in Iran, Central Asia, South Asia, the Caucasus, Balkans, as well as places like Crimea uh, and Azerbaijan and so on. Sephardic Jews who came to Israel from majority Muslim countries also continue to commemorate Nabruz. So another example of the crossover. Of course, Nabruz is a major Ismaili festival. And we see many other influences of Zoroastrianism and ancient other ancient Iranian religions in, in the Ismaili faith, the practices of the Ismaili faith. We see it in Persian Ismaili philosophy and poetry. We see it in the design of Pamiri houses, as well as in the commemoration, the celebration of the Chirag Roshan in Pamirs, as well as in other parts, uh, as well in some parts of Badakhshan. And also in design of, of uh, Jamaat Khanas, of Ismaili centers. On the left is the Char Khana design of the skylight uh, in the Pamiri house. Uh, basically, this is based on the Pamiri house design and is in the Ismaili center of Dushanbe in Tajikistan. So you can see that these ancient ideas from other religions are present in Ismaili Jamaat Khanas. Similarly, in the Ismaili Center, which is being built in Houston, the column style are from is from the ancient Persepolis design of columns, and you can see that this continues. This is something that is has become part of contemporary Ismaili architecture. Let's come to Indian civilization. India is one of the oldest continuous civilizations in the world. And it has been known in ancient and more recent times for its advances in mathematics, science, medicine, in philosophy, art, architecture, music, and other things. It has a number of religions, the Hindu, Jain, Buddhist, Jewish, Christian, Islamic, Sikh, and other faiths. Of the, in, in the Hindu religion, the main sources, the main scriptures are the Vedas and the Puranas, which are uh, older uh, sources. And it, they also include the Upanishads, the Mahabharata, including Bhagavad Gita and the Ramayana. So how is this related to Satpant? But before we go into Satpant, let's look at its religio-cultural environment. Bhakti, which is a mode of populist worship, emerged about a thousand years ago in India, first in South India and then moved to North India. It emphasized personal devotion and love for divinity, just like the Sufi tradition. This is symbolized in Bhakti, uh, for example, in Radha and Mira's devotion for Sri Krishna. Bhakti and Sufi movements, because of the similarities, inter intermingled. And of course, we know that Muslims first arrived in India about a thousand years ago. And so this kind of intermingling has been taking place for a long, long time. And it led to the development of traditions, which um, Sultan Somji calls the Guru Peer traditions. Gurus, Sants, Bhagats, Babas, Peers circulated in Indian society, teaching the importance of personal devotion and love for divinity. And they began to cross over 
across various religions. They were interested in spiritual truth rather than religious orthodoxy. And in fact, they criticized orthodoxy. They spread their message through poetic compositions by and large, which, were, which included bhajans, banis, shabads, grants, ginans, garbis, etc. And these were in various Indic languages and used Indic symbols, myth, and music. So we can see from this variety of pictures how different people of diff who are people who are officially affiliated with specific religions have come together in certain kinds of worship that overlap. So starting at the top on the left, we look at a gathering of uh, various people of various religions, of uh, people who would be seen as a Hindu sadhu in a Sufi peer uh, and others. Then we have a picture, a more recent picture of people who are formerly, two women who are formerly Hindu singing uh, Sufi songs. Next, uh, we have a picture of uh, uh, Guru Nanak uh, and um, uh, a Sufi uh, a sheikh called uh, uh, Farududdin uh, Ganshakar. Uh, it is interesting that in the Guru Granth Sahib, the scriptures of the of six, Guru Nanak included a variety of material from other religions, including uh, Faruddin uh, Ganshakar's poetry. In the next slide, we have a picture together of Sant Kabir and Guru Nanak. Now. Kabir was another person who brought together uh, the Hindu and, and Muslim beliefs, uh, just like Guru Nanak did. And so people see them as being similar in this particular portrayal. And you have many uh, images like this that you can find on the internet. A singer, a, a contemporary singer, um, Abida Parveen, who is very well known for, among Ismailis at least, for having sung a ginan in the presence of the Imam, also is very well known for singing Kabir's uh, poetry. Uh, then we have um, a picture of uh, uh, Sai Baba, who also in his, in the way that he preached uh, religious ideas, brought together Muslim and Hindu concepts. Um, Indian film, Bollywood, has also taken up uh, these ideas and portrayals of uh, the coming together of the two religions. And here in, in, uh, in one of the slides, we have a picture of, uh, it's actually from the movie uh, Amar Akbar Anthony, in which the person playing the character of Akbar, uh, a Muslim, is singing a Kawali in a very Hindu, a characteristically Hindu setting of a temple dedicated to Sai Baba. So these, these kinds of social phenomena, religious phenomena cut across various borders. Then we have a slide which says, Roughly to now, there is a tradition of Muslim bhajan singers. And of course, as I said, uh, Bollywood has, has certainly shown, at least earlier Bollywood films from previous decades, have, have included uh, Muslim singers singing Hindu bhajans in a very, very deeply felt and emotional way. Uh, you also have... Uh, uh, the tradition of uh, Mira bhajans, which are sung by Muslims. You have the balls, uh, uh, a tradition in Bengal, where um, the coming together of Muslim and, and Hindu ideas and practices have really flourished among the balls. And Ginans, of course, uh, which have brought together these ideas and which I'll talk about further. But in this particular uh, image, it is a, an album uh, in which uh, a person of Sikh background, Rageshwari Lomba, has sung Ginans and recorded them. 
And of course, Ismailis also sing ghazals uh, and Sufi songs and bhajans and so on. So this is something that is quite typical in understanding how religions, how faiths have come together and do come together. This is very much in contrast with the hard identities that, is, that have become quite uh, common in the way that we understand religion. So let's talk about Guru Peer traditions. There's a wide following uh, of these traditions in India, Pakistan, uh, Bangladesh, and in diasporas. Even though people may have formal identifications as Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs, etc., they have these crossovers while maintaining their identities. Even among Satpant groups, we have uh, Ismailis who identify as Muslims, but then another Satpant group, the Imam Shahis, who have a general Hindu outlook, yet both sing Ginans and call themselves Satpantis. The Guru Peer traditions are occasionally critical of orthodoxy and ritualism. Some people would say are often critical of these things. There are disagreements and rivalries even among them. It's no, not all hunky-dory between them. They do disagree with each other, uh, but they share a universal outlook on the search for spiritual truth. So in terms of settlement beliefs, one way to understand how the Ismaili faith came to India is to see it as peers from Iran planting the seed of Dawat al-Haq, the invitation to truth as the religion was known, as the faith was known in the Middle East, in Indian soil. And this came to be known as Satpant, a synonym, I would imagine, of Dawat al-Haq. Of course, this quest for truth is expressed in Indic Islamic religious culture. Ismaili Satpant holds to the Shia centrality of imamat, that the imam is satgur, using Indian terminology, that he is the true teacher, the teacher of, or the teacher of truth. This corresponds uh, to the term mohek in Arabic Ismaili vocabulary. And he is presented in Ginans as the final manifestation in the cosmology of Vishnu's avatars. So you can see that the ideas that are taken are from the uh, religious uh, cultural context of, uh, of India. The word Ginans come from the Sanskrit root, as you may know, of Janana, which means knowledge, religious knowledge or spiritual knowledge. And they have, uh, they, they comprise of diverse lyrical compositions, Inans, Grunts, Garbis, Ventis, etc. And they're attributed to various peers and Sayyids, Shams, Sadardin, Imam Begum, etc. And they are recited by Khojas, Momnas, Shamsis, Guptis, Imam Shahis, and others. Their content and vocabulary is polyvalent, the term that is often used by Ali Asani. So what we have here is Shia Ismaili Islamic concepts, Sufi and Bhakti devotional modes, Vaishnav cosmology and myth, and North Indian or Hindustani Raga musical tradition. All these come together in the Ginans. Because as I've explained earlier, the borrowing has been going on in various traditions, in various religions. This is very common. It is not anomalous. It is something that not only Ismailis or Muslims, but various other religions have been doing. And it is very common to human practice. And in Ginans, this is the shape it has taken. There are diverse themes. In the Ginans, of course, as you know, the search for enlightenment, devotion, ethics, etc. The content speaks to the prevailing Indic Islamic religious cultural environment. 
The Imam is variously called, and this draws from various languages, Mola from Arabic, Shah from Persian, Sahib also from Persian, Satgur, Sant, Naklang from the Indic context. Another example of how the Indic uh, Islamic uh, uh, environment is reflected in the Ginaj is that the male composer and the male singer assumes the female voice, just as in Mirabai's Bhakti. Venti's often echo Radha, Radha's Virahini, which, which is basically the soul longing for divine union. The mode of bhajans also appear in some Ginaj. Others resemble narratives from Indic epics. For example, the Ginan, which was played before this event uh, online, uh, was uh, Karsanji Bharse Arjun Sambro. Uh, so this sounds like Sri Krishna and Arjun's conversation uh, at Kurukshetra, which is related in Bhagavad Gita. So, as I've been saying, the universal truth is a very important concept here. And one of the Ginans, Hetesu Milos Re Munivaro by Pir Sadadin, says all scriptures are based on truth, which echoes in a way what uh, Imam Sultan Mamacha also said in that quote. Asamani Tambal Vajya, which was also recited uh, before this event, refers to Vedas along with Brahma. Vishnu and Maheshwar. They, these are all terms from the Indic context. And they are mentioned in the Ginan, as of course, these terms also appear, and similar terms appear in many other Ginans. This is the Brahma, Vishnu, and Maheshwar is seen as the unified triad of divinity. The Ginan exhorts, then goes on to, in another verse, goes on to exhort adherence to Prophet Muhammad's words. So you have figures from the Indic context and the Islamic context together. And then the Ginan speaks of Ved Quran, presenting Indic and Islamic scriptural traditions as part of a continuing divine truth. So whereas the Ved would come from the Vedas in the Indic context and Quran from the Islamic context, they are brought together in the term Ved Quran. So how do we understand symbols and myth in these contexts? The idea here is to search for universal truth in the Quran and other scriptures. This truth cannot be obtained through a literal or surface interpretation. So to use the Arabic term tawil, Ismailis have been using this particular mode of interpretation to understand scripture, to understand the symbolism within scripture, within the Quran and other scripture. The word tawil means to go to the original source of a word or symbol, to its original spiritual source, which is what the, 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 the approach to the bathin implies, the reading of inner meanings. It is trying to understand the underlying spiritual essence of a word or a symbol or a story. And that reveals its link to universal truth. So Guru Pui traditions, as I've said, you know, have come about through the intermingling of Vedic and Islamic traditions. And they lie in the liminal zone, the in, which is the in-between position, the crossroads, the threshold between two different religions, formal religions. The word liminality offers, or the, the status of liminality, offers unique perception, not a one-sided perspective. It is a multidimensional site of the human quest for truth. And it is not confined by narrow notions of religion as being very monolithic. So the Guru Pir traditions are at the intersections of the Indic and Islamic worldviews. 
This space is rich and dynamic. It is integrative of traditions and worldviews. And it is also generative of art and thought and nourishes deep spirituality. One way to, at least what I have found uh, useful in understanding this particular idea is a recent uh, art installation by the artist Anish Kapoor, who is uh, British based. Uh, in this installation, he shows how two elements on the sides uh, are in juxtaposition with a circle in the middle. But this is very personal. This is my own interpretation. It may not appeal to you. So let's look at the Ginanic symbolism of the in-between. Several Ginans narrate the Puranic story of Karnakans, and I'd like to draw on this story to show the idea of the liminal in the Ginans. In this symbolic narrative, the demon king who, who could be vanquished not by a being in human or animal form, neither during day or night, neither indoors nor outdoors, neither on earth nor above. So basically he was invincible. He was seen as being invincible. He had been granted this because he had previously been a very humble devotee and a very strong religious follower. But he turned to evil and he became an oppressor of his people because he, he was seen that, you know, that nobody could kill him or he could not be killed any, in any place or anywhere, neither by a person who was human or, or animal. He could not be killed during the day or night. He could not be killed indoors or outdoors nor on earth or above. So where would he be killed? He would live forever perhaps. So the evil demon's domain was an exclusionary binary elements, night or day, indoors, outdoors, earth above. These are two essential elements that we have in our existence. Now in the story, Narsi Avtar, the fourth Avtar of Vishnu, managed to vanquish the demon, Harnakans, in the liminal zone. He came to earth, and now he is part man and part lion, the way he is portrayed. So not just human or animal. And he destroyed Harnakans at a time that was not day or night, it was in the evening. He vanquished Harnakans in the courtyard of a house, not inside nor outside. And he was destroyed in Nursi's lap, not ground or above. So this is a way for the story which comes from the Puranas to really symbolize the power of goodness in liminal space. It's an allegorical myth which shows how goodness, the power, there's a very special power, a unique power in the in-between, in the liminal. That it overcomes the poverty of binaries, and that this space is potent and creative. It is not captive to binaries, but intersectional and pluralist. It enables perception beyond binaries limited perspectives. It helps transcend hard religious labels. It bridges rigid positions. It overcomes limitations. It opens the door to liberation from evil. And it fosters the timeless search for universal spiritual truth. So we can see that Satpanth has incorporated into itself some very interesting ways of explaining goodness and truth. Nevertheless, today we find that there are threats to Satpat and to other Guru Peer traditions. That this happens because extremists gain power by ascribing enemies with hard identities. They, they, they do not, they are not uh, favorable to the in-between to liminality. They use identity politics to erase the space in between. 
when rigid characteries, char categories erase rich fluidity of human existence, a state of profound loss descends on the world. When, when Satpant is, is neglected, when the liminality, when its fluidity is not understood, when there's a threat to it from both sides, whether it is Muslim or Hindu, this is when the problems start occurring. Because there's a dominance today of people favoring rigid labels like Islamic and Hindu. They do not value the place of liminality in the spiritual quest. They do not discern the timeless validity of myth-based symbols. They do not recognize the search for universal truth in Gilans. And so what I've tried to do is to show that in Satpant and in Ginans and in the various Guru Puri traditions, there's something very special that tries to transcend the hard identities which have caused the kind of friction and conflict that unfortunately exists in many parts of the world. But I have found some optimism in my own backyard, living in Canada. I've seen that a people who were suppressed, who, whose culture, whose spirituality, whose way of life, whose language was suppressed by colonialism for 200, maybe more, more than 200 years, are coming back. They are teaching their children their own language, their culture, their spiritual ways. And it is a lesson for us to respect what is what has been part of our ancient traditions, what has been part of our way to understand spirituality and the truth, and perhaps regain for ourselves some of what we have lost. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Kareem. An amazingly thought-provoking talk, and it was filled with insights. Um, I have a few comments on your lecture and, and a brief summary, if I may, uh, Professor Karim. Uh, what an insightful lecture this was, because I remember when we were promoting your talk through several media, we received many messages from people who were quite um, intrigued and curious to know whether Ginans are Hindu or Islamic, one or the other. Um, and I think you have masterfully demonstrated how this question itself is flawed. Um, that we are looking at the question through such a narrow lens of constructed identities of religion. And looking deeper, we could find that as human beings, there is so much more that we share, what you call a common spiritual sense, the need to nourish the inner being and have a connection with each other. In addition, you also talk about how believers of all religion, religions seek deep relationship with divinity. You talked about how the quest for truth or haq or sat underlies human spirituality and how Quran, Ginans and various other religious texts express spiritual truths through myths, symbols, metaphors, through different art forms, music, literature and ritual. You also showed about how different religions interacted with each other, borrowing from each other's intellectual traditions, which again is reflected in art, architecture, literature, and music. It was very interesting to note that many religious tra traditions have similar ways of remembering God through, you showed the mala and the rosary and the tasbi, and you talk of the various Christians and Muslim interactions with each other in the past and even present, like the Sufi shrine of Kwaja Moinuddin Chishti, which is visited by people of all faiths. Then when you come to the Satpan's religious cultural environment, you showed how the Bhakti and the Sufi movements intermingled with the Guru Peer tradition in the Indian subcontinent. And coming to the Satpan beliefs, you noted that peers from Iran planted the seed of, seed of Dawat al-Haq and expressed their quest for truth in the form of Ginans in the subcontinent. Also, the vocabulary the peers talk in embodies not just the Shia Imami 
concept of imamat, but also speaks through the Sufi and Bhakti devotional modes, the Vaishnava cosmology, the myth along with the Hindustani raga or musical tradition. So it's all a combination of the culture and it reflects the culture in that time, at that time. The Ginans have a diverse theme such as, you, like you mentioned, search for enlightenment, devotion, ethics, and so on. And how the peers have seamlessly weaved a smiley satvant with symbols, epics, and forms of music with the prevalent culture. You also share the example of how the Bhagavad Gita is narrated in the Ginans, and many Ginans refer to the Vedas on Brahma, Vishnu, and Maheshwara as a unified triad of divinity. But at the same time, the peer time, the peers speak of the way the Quran presenting the Indic and Islamic scriptural traditions as a part of continuing quest for the divine truth. But understanding these myths and symbols through a literal or surface interpretation defeats the purpose, as you as you point out. And you also talk about how, as the Smileys, we use Tabil to interpret. Uh, and it's bathing or the esoteric reading of its deeper spiritual meaning. And towards the end, you talk about the liminal zone, which is an in-between position that offers a multi-dimensional perspective of the human quest for truth. And that cannot be defined by narrow notions of religion, which as you beautifully put it, is integrative of traditions and worldviews. I think what you have shared with us in a simple language is a new, is, is, a, is an offering, is your offering, you have, you have offered to show a new way of thinking about Ginans rather than seeing it through a particular religion. And so thank you, Professor Kareem, for such an enlightening, uh, enlightening talk. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. We shall now begin the Q&A session. And I do have some questions. Um, let me start by the questions which I have taken down. One of the first questions I have is, um, is, uh, is it Ali Anant Anant or Hari Anant Anant? So that's a question because there's a different in recitation in, in the US and Canada as somebody has asked. I, I don't think I want to step into that uh, debate. <laughs> I, I, I would have to I leave it to the scholars who look at the uh, the manuscripts, uh, who, who basically would be able to perhaps shed better light on that. So we have to understand that um, this is an oral, a primarily an oral tradition. And an oral tradition sometimes has variations. Uh, and then, then when they're written down by different people, they may be written in slightly differing ways. So this is something that is, uh, I, I guess, uh, would have to be determined through uh, proper scholarly study of various manuscripts that have uh, written down that Gidan. Thank you, Professor Karim. There is another question. Um... Based on your lecture, what future space do Ginans occupy? Well, as long as there is a human need and desire for spirituality, um, the Ginans offer an insight into that spirituality. What has happened over the last few decades, perhaps the entire century, is a, unfortunately, a distancing of ourselves from, from of the Satpant, uh, the Satpanthis from Satpant. What has happened is that many people have lost the language. The languages were not taught in communal schools. That was a very deliberate decision due to westernization. Um, and so, first of all, the, the ability to understand directly the words. Secondly, uh, having lost the religio-cultural context, even people who grew up in India 
uh, they may not they may know something of the the context uh, in which the Ginans were written, but of course they were written in various over seven hundred years or so. So it is, it is of course difficult to remember to know uh, the context of previous times. But there are certain things which are continuing in in the in the culture uh, the cultural laws of India and so on, in for which there needs to be an effort made to to understand the context of uh, various references within the Ginans. So obviously this needs some work. Uh, it can be made easier by groups like the Association for the Study of Ginans, by the South Asian Studies Unit at the Institute of Smiley Studies to prepare the literature, which enables those who are interested in accessing whether it is through Western languages or whatever, it doesn't matter, but to make more accessible uh, the, the content of the Ginans and understanding of its, the religio-cultural environment in which they were, they were written, they were formed, uh, and a, a better understanding overall of uh, what Ginans are and how they relate to universal spirituality as a whole. Thank you, Professor Karim. Another question I have is, given that Ginans are a shared heritage, what opportunities exist to build bridges now with different communities in your perspective? I think that's a very important question. Um, singing Ginans together with other people who sing Ginans, I think would be a first step. Uh, that, that hopefully would open up doors uh because the the hard identities have, have created these separations it is often in song that we come together in music uh, secondly uh carrying out a dialogue based on the commonalities not the differences that would help uh, finding other ways of reducing conflict of understanding the damaging and the negative elements of identity politics. I think that is very important. So hopefully that will lead to better understanding. That's a very good answer. There's another question. How do we go about reclaiming that liminal space that you talk about in the contemporary context? Yes. Uh, so, the liminal space, thankfully, has not completely disappeared. The very fact that we are sitting here today having these discussions shows that there is in existence a Ginanic culture in the community and in other communities, that it has this liminal space, even though people may not consciously think of the interconnections uh, of different cultures and different religions that exist in Satpant and other Guru Peer traditions. It is there. So once we become aware of that, then hopefully we can cherish them. This is a very precious space, but it is, it is very fragile. It can be eliminated. You know, the word eliminate and liminal have the same root in Latin. And we need to basically ensure that the elimination, the erasure, which has been carried out of the Ginanic tradition of Satpanth, whether it is through the, uh, the discontinuation of learning languages, of um, banning certain Ginans, etc., that this needs to be reconsidered in a fresh, with a fresh eye to understand what, what a precious resource we have and what a precious place we are in and learn to expand this space. That we can do it, first of all, by recognizing its value ourselves and carrying out a dialogue or discussion amongst ourselves and with those people who have the ability to, to expand this even more within the community. Thank you, Professor Karim. 
one other question. Singing of Kinans is referred to as music of the heart. So why are we using musical instruments? Well, I, I don't know where this phrase comes from. Um, I know that uh, composers, Sayyids like uh, Imam Begum used the Tanpura. Uh, I know that there is a, um, a tradition of uh, just singing the Ninans a cappella without music. Uh, it's a debatable issue. Uh, I know that when I listen to Ginans, it's just the voice, it's very enriching. When I hear Ginans with music, it's also enriching. So I personally don't have a problem. With that. Right. Um, there is another question which says, which asks, are Ginans devotional or sacred scriptures? That's an interesting question. Uh, when, you, when someone uses the word devotional, uh, basically, okay, so first of all, let's, let's remember that when we use the word ginans, we're talking about perhaps a thousand ginans, and very few of them are recited, but, but there are many, many ginans. Secondly, they have a fair amount of diversity within them. So some which, which basically uh, refer to the path of the believer in recognizing the Satguru, of following him, etc. Uh, those perhaps can be seen, some of those can be seen as devotional. The, the Ventis perhaps are seen as devotional, but let's not stop there. What does the word sacred mean? It, it has a, a certain connotation of, of being divine. If we were to go back to what I said earlier about the search for truth of universal spirituality, if one is totally absorbed in a particular ginan that brings a person close to that state of mind, to that state of being, I personally have no problem calling it sacred. Thank you, Professor Karim. I think, I think this brings us to the end. So on behalf of ASG, let me take this opportunity to say a heartfelt thank you to Professor Karim for sharing your uh, wealth of knowledge with us. I have thoroughly enjoyed listening to you all, to you, and I think so have all of us. Um, we are all enriched by the in-depth understanding and knowledge you have shared with us, as well as your time. And we would be happy to have you back anytime. Thanks very much, Mira. And thanks like, for the honor. You're welcome. I would also like to thank our IT and design team, Altaf, Alina, and Naila. Special thanks to the chairman who has been working tirelessly behind the scenes, along with some of our own members. Finally, many thanks to all of you, the audience who have joined us from across the world. Thank you for joining us for this keynote address. Please be on a lookout for our future Ginan Insight Talks on Facebook and also our webinar recording and on our ASG YouTube channel. Also, please visit our new ASG website and don't forget to fill the feedback form. The links are all pasted on the pasted on in the chat box. Thank you all and have a wonderful evening. Yali Madad.